Last week I posted a video about the biggest hesitation in today's market being largely about the higher interest rates compared to a year ago or a few years ago. A good friend of mine who's also one of the most experienced and intelligent lenders that I work with, Chris Hardeman, is here on the show today to help explain some options that people may have to proceed in today's market that they may not know otherwise or that most people don't know about. So Chris, welcome to the show. Chris, thanks for having me. You good got to be it. here. If someone's going to refinance after they purchase in today's market, what type of package is the company you're working with or what are you seeing out there available for the people who will be refinancing or would if interest rates go down? So if you purchase in today's market, buy a house, let's use a very easy number. Flat 7% interest rate is what you get. We don't know when interest rates are gonna drop. We don't know how much they're going to drop by. But what we are saying is that anytime within the next 24 months, Provided you have made six monthly payments, we will refinance your loan without my company charging any of its lender fees. How much are typical lender fees if that program did not exist? They vary company to company. I've seen them as low as five to six hundred dollars. That's very uncommon, but when you're dealing with some of your, you know, your online mass production lenders, I've seen it. I've seen them as high as twenty-five hundred dollars. Uh, my company charges $1,460. So that's the true savings if you go with us. For the people that didn't see me break down the math on a $500,000 house as an example, a lot of people are hesitant to buy real estate right now because interest rates are so high. So I wanted to take an in-depth look at numbers to see if it makes sense to buy now or possibly wait. So if we use a $500,000 house for round number sake and we finance 80% or put 20% down, that means you finance $400,000 put 100,000 down at 7% interest, today's interest rate for 30 years fix, that would give you a house payment of about $3,650 per month. Seems like a lot. However, if you compare it to 5%, let's do 5% interest for 30 years fix, that would reduce your monthly payment by roughly $500 a month. So that would bring it down to 3,150. For the year, that's a difference of $6,000. So that's the difference between a 5% and 7% for the course of a year. It's really $6,000. Doesn't seem like too much when you're talking about putting potentially $100,000 down. Now what would happen if interest rates went back down to five is all of the buyers are gonna come out of the woodwork and things are gonna go crazy and prices go up significantly, right? So if they're up 10% from last year, this $500,000 house now costs 550,000. So it's about six grand a year, 12 grand over two years. When you're talking about comparing that to the potential of overbidding or paying over asking price, waiving appraisals, doing appraisal gaps, all of those types of things, 12 grand in the grand scheme of paying for a home really doesn't seem like that much, right? Well, it's not, and I would, I would you know, counter, counter question you being the, the realtor in the room, even in a call it two to three multiple offer bidding scenario, how likely is it that someone's gonna bump their offer up by 10 grand? It's extremely likely. Now, now say you're in a 15 buyer multiple offer scenario, and yeah. then it's gonna get way out of hand. Right, and when that happened last time, it went from anywhere from five grand to 10 grand over on a normal case mm -hmm. to anywhere from 50 to 100 grand over. And then it gets a little bit more crazy because then you know once you get your wild over, over market contract price that actually goes to contract, now the seller begins dictating terms, which puts the buyer into a very disadvantageous situation, like waiving inspection, you know, th things that you as, as a realtor would never advise a, a client to do, right, right. In, in a standard normal market. And, and these are the terms that they are unfortunately forced to accept in those, you know, I'll call them hyper seller markets if they wanna get under contract on a property. So a lot of people know about conventional loans. When I talk to most people who haven't done real estate transaction in the recent past or ever, they think 20% down. I always educate them that they could do different percentages down. Can you explain about the different rates that they can get with conventional loan? And does it always have to be 30 year fixed or is there other options that people can use that might make a home more affordable. It's a wonderful point to bring up because it's remarkable how often as a lender, 
we are presented in an initial phone call with the same kind of perception, right? Preconceived notion about the whole 20% is required to buy a house. It's not wild that it's still out there. It's, it's what people have heard. It's what their parents have told them. It's what their family has told them. It's wonderful that like content creation is becoming such a thing in the real estate industry because as more of this education and this content goes out on the social media platforms, it hopefully will, will help educate buyers. If Let's put some real information out there. Uh, conventional loans, as little as 3% down, unless you're utilizing a down payment assistance source. So people can actually put only 3% down and still do a conventional loan. Correct. And then obviously they could still do 20. They, they, can, they can do 90. You're gonna have a hard time finding a lender who wants that, but they can. So first time home buyers, and to define a first time home buyer in the eyes of Fannie Mae or Freddie Mac, that's you have not been on title to a home in the past three years, you qualify as a first time home buyer. So you can put as little as 3% down. So people always come to me, oh, I'm a first time home buyer. I want one of those first time home buyer loans. Give me, give me one of those. And it's like, that's the same conventional loan I'd give everyone else, but you are entitled to put as little as 3% down if you would like to. From what I understand, people liked the 20% idea or that became a popular idea because it avoided people having to pay what's called prime mortgage insurance. Is that still a thing with 3% down or at what percent does private mortgage insurance stop or how does that work? So private mortgage insurance in, in, in the most simplistic answer to your question goes away at 20% down and is always present if you put less than 20% down. Now, uh, think about it like any insurance policy, right? Think about it like your automotive insurance. You can pay it in a lot of different ways. The premium, right? You, your car insurance. You can pay it once a month. You can pay it every three months. You can write a check every six months. There's different mechanisms and methods by which you can pay that premium. And the same thing applies to private mortgage insurance. The most common method by which people pay it is just what we call borrower paid monthly. So you pay one twelfth of that mortgage insurance premium every month with your mortgage payment. There's lots of other ways to pay it. You can do a single premium. You can do a lender paid single premium where we pay that premium for you one time and you take on a higher interest rate. It all goes into the objective, what we're trying to accomplish with that mortgage insurance and what makes the most sense financially to the borrower in terms of how long they'll be in the home, is their objective lower cash to close at the closing table? Is their objective the lowest monthly payment possible? The one thing that I can say about private mortgage insurance is credit score really, really matters. Mm. If, if you have almost impeccable credit, private mortgage insurance is not a big number when you're looking at it and you're evaluating, hey, would I rather pay an extra 35 bucks a month and have an extra 45 grand in my bank or what, what matters the most to me? Cash on hand versus monthly payment. As your credit score begins to dip lower, it starts to become a very material figure, which is why when you're evaluating anything with a mortgage transaction, you got to look at the whole picture and you really got to look at the goals. That's why our potential clients absolutely need to have a very good conversation with a very good lender to make sure they have a package that makes sense for them and their home search process and criteria. And their financial future, right? So FHA loans typically are 3.5% down and conventional, now that we know it's 3% down minimum, what are the pros and cons or difference between going with conventional versus FHA for those people looking to do something like that? It's a, gr it's a great question and it's a conversation that's coming up now more than it has in a number of years because Fannie Mae and Freddie Mac have changed the charges, what we call LLPAs, loan level pricing adjusters, at different credit score levels on conventional loans. And it was big news in, in, in really all the major headlines a couple months ago and there was a lot of misinformation out there, but that's another, another story for another time. But really, most of the time, the decision, are we going FHA or are we going conventional, is being driven by the borrower's credit profile. And it's relatively easy for me to say to a borrower, hey, you need to go this way, and this is why. Or alternatively, you need to go this way, and this is why. 
But there is a window there, and I, I kind of identify it, and while it's not perfect, between like 680 and 720 credit scores, which believe it or not, a lot of the population falls into that window, where you need to evaluate both options side by side and think about which one, again, given, given your financial picture, how long are you gonna be in the house, what's your objective with the house, that you really need to look at both options side by side. And it plays into the private mortgage insurance conversation that we just had pretty well. Because again, private mortgage insurance, keyword there being private, right? And that's on conventional loans. That's dictated by the private market. So there's six major private mortgage insurers. And just like anything else in the private sector, you create competition, right? So they're all going to offer different options in terms of premiums with the insurance that they offer. And they can vary at different credit score levels. Like I said, as you start dipping into lower credit score levels, mm -hmm. private mortgage insurance can become a very real number in terms of monthly cost, usually upfront cost at closing in the case of a single premium, but it can become very material, which is different than FHA, where you just have MI, mortgage insurance, which is a set figure dictated by Department of HUD, Housing and Urban Development, no matter what your credit score is, it's, it's there, right? Which is you dip lower towards that kind of high 600, low 700 range, you're typically gonna have a lower monthly expense on the mortgage insurance side with an FHA loan than you would with a conventional loan. So that's factor one, right, monthly. Mm -hmm. But as we've talked about before, with a conventional loan, you can get rid of that mortgage insurance once you get around that 80% loan to value metric, which as we all know with, with mortgages, particularly 30 year mortgages, usually you're paying nothing but interest in the first couple of years, right? As your payment amortizes. So typically a borrower gets to that 80% based upon the home appreciating in value before the mortgage goes down low enough to get there. So as you start dancing around like, hey, you know, we're putting 10% down, we're putting 15% down, but you know, we could have a lower monthly payment if we went with FHA because our credit is a little bit troubled, right? But then we have to take into account, all right, but you're gonna get to that 80% in two years, three years, four years, even if we just look at more normal kind of annualized appreciation right. and values, 3%, something like that. It should that. be four or five years. It should be, right. right? So now we're thinking, okay, if you wanna get to that point and take this FHA loan, now we have to factor in the cost of a refinance out at that period if you want to remove that mortgage insurance at that time. And I think the biggest one that people commonly overlook when they're evaluating the difference between mortgage or between conventional and FHA is the upfront mortgage insurance premium. People always think about the monthly. They always ignore the upfront mortgage insurance premium that exists with an FHA loan, which is a material figure. It's almost 2% of the loan amount, but because it's financed, it's in the loan, people don't think about it as much because it's not cash out of their pocket on the day of closing. But it is cash out of their pocket someday when they sell the house, right. when they refinance into conventional, all these things, right? So I get it, it's not pain day one, but if we're not talking about your financial future, where you're going with this, is this your, your first home and you're gonna use this to stepping stone into your 10 year home for your growing family, you're taking big dollars out of your net worth by going with that product. And don't get me wrong, my first home, I purchased with an FHA loan. It's a wonderful financial product, but you have to look at all the pieces of the puzzle if you're evaluating both side by side. And this is uh, something unique to Central Florida. We have two different markets. We have the primary market where most people live full-time. It's their full-time residence. Then we have a vacation market. If we look at the primary market, we have lots of first-time buyers, but we also have a lot of downsizers, people where the children are going off to college, so they don't need this large home anymore and they want to move a two-story house to a condo like our client last month 
who has no particular income, but they own their house outright. So they tons have tons of equity of, in their home. Tons of equity. Is there an option for them to be able to finance another house so they can move into it, so they could sell their house vacant? Is there a product for them out there? In that particular instance, yes. Absolutely, there is a product for that particular client. But I will tell you a different story. Because it's something that a lot of people are going to be talking about in the very near future. A lot of mortgage guys are talking about it right now, but it hasn't really hit the general population yet in terms of information that's out there and it's being discussed. And that's because the, the product itself has a very negative stigma from the days of old. And we're going to talk about why that stigma is no longer a reality. Yeah. That's the reverse mortgage. And people hear it and they go, whoa. Like, all I know is I know so-and-so. I had an uncle. It got totally screwed by one of those things, right? Very negative stigma from the days of old. But I will tell you this. If you look at the inventory issue that we have right now, which we spoke about, yes, the, the interest rates are certainly contributing to the inventory issue. But I would argue that an equal to or greater factor contributing to the inventory issue is that the baby boomer generation, when you look at, and, and Tom Ferry, great slide on this, like great slide, I, I can send it to you. When you look at the amount of the inventory that is controlled by the baby boomer generation nationwide, it's a staggering percentage. I don't wanna quote it and be wrong. Before we go too deep, what is a reverse mortgage? So a reverse mortgage basically takes, equity goes in reverse, right? So think about it. Instead of you making a monthly mortgage payment every single month, which pays interest and reduces your principal balance, it goes the other way around. Days of old, a payment was made to the individual. That is not this product and it tacked on to the principal balance of their home. Mm -hmm. And what happened in the past was we had, you know, what I, you know, I'll call it a freak occurrence, but really what it was was an unusual time, 2007, 2008, when we saw home values decline at such a rapid rate. Individuals that had reverse mortgages, typically like senior citizens, retirees, their values of their home dropped beneath the principal balance of their mortgage, okay? Unfortunately, those loans were full recourse to the borrower or even more unfortunately, the borrower's estate if they passed away. So what happened was people were upside down in homes, a lot of reverse mortgages had been sold to senior citizens, they passed away, their heirs were left with an asset that was worth less than the money that was owed on it, and they had to figure that out, right? And that, that was a tough situation to be in. Now, fast forward to today. Legislation was passed in 2010, actually, that changed all the reverse mortgages offered by the Department of HUD. So this is actually an FHA product, okay? Which means, there's a huge mortgage insurance fund somewhere backing these products, okay, that they are no longer full recourse. They are now non-recourse products. So they can't go after the estate if someone you, were to pass it, away. You know, it goes wrong. You, you, your parents have this product. God forbid the world repeats itself one more time and home values decline. You and I don't believe that's going to happen. Most people don't. Let's say it does. Whoever is your, your descendant, your heir, managing your estate, they have the ability to walk into the, the servicer, the bank, whoever it may be, leave the deed on the table, walk out the door, no harm, no foul, no damage to credit, no, none, no judgments, no collections, mm -hmm. no nothing, right? right? No nothing. So let's, let's talk about why the boomer generation is holding on to this inventory, okay? Sure. Qualifying for a mortgage. Now, when they had a wonderful W-2 salary job, they owned their own business, whatever they did before they retired, 
it was very easy to qualify for the mortgage they needed to purchase that retirement home, that dream home, whatever it may be. But that's changed. They retired now. They're probably receiving Social Security, probably, like in almost 99.9% .9 of instances, if they paid into Social Security, they're receiving Social Security. Right. Or living off of retirement funds and things like that. Maybe, maybe, right? They are maybe receiving a pension. You'd be shocked how many aren't, okay? Now you come into the third bucket, which is did they plan for retirement properly? So are they taking a mandatory withdrawal from an IRA or a 401k? Or did they purchase an annuity, right? Those are all planning things. They can't really depend upon those unless they planned very early on in life to do that. Mm -hmm. So I say all this because their ability to qualify before they retired was very different than their ability to qualify in retirement, right? right? But to why we started talking about this, they have boatloads of equity in a home. So the product is called a HECM. It's a home equity conversion mortgage, which, you know, to just break it down, lets you convert the equity you have in a current home into your dream home, sure. right? And the unique thing about it is you take that equity, you sell that home, right? You move a portion of that equity, which I typically see borrowers do, is they sell a home for, they net 300 grand. I'll typically see them take half of it, two thirds of it, and take that equity conversion into the next home, but then they'll usually take another portion of it and convert that portion into some sort of income. They'll put it into like an IRA, something of the sort, and they'll let that kind of work with them for the rest of their retired life. But what it lets us as a lender do is, and I'm gonna pull numbers totally out of thin air, instead of qualifying them for a $250,000 mortgage, whatever it may be, we use the Heckam product to qualify them for a $650,000 mortgage because they put enough of that equity conversion in there that's working sort of backwards on their equity table on the new home. As they're living in it, they're never making a payment. Payments do not start until after they pass away. All right? Try and wrap your head around that one. Payments do not start until after they pass away. So you've now taken the housing payment burden off of that retiree, put them into the home that they want to be in, gotten them to sell the other home, which brings more inventory back on the market and gets them into a completely non-recourse. Their kids don't need to worry about it. Just FHA loan product that gets them into that home for the remainder of their life. Wow, without a payment. Without a payment. That's incredible. I know, and no one's talking about it. Nobody knows about this. Yeah. Now they do. Yeah. There we go. So what about in the scenario for the people who have the house, they can't sell it until they move out because of their situation? Is there an option out there for somebody in that, in that boat? There is. Uh, so in that particular instance, and this was a really, really, really unique case, because um, he had like boatloads of equity boatloads of equity, um, you, you are able to do a couple things. Uh, in his instance, what the easiest thing for him to do and what we were trying to get the whole thing structured was he had enough equity in the home he was exiting to be able to get a home equity line of credit. We didn't want to do a cash out refinance, just the costs, fees associated with everything, but he had enough equity to be able to draw a home equity line of credit on his existing home, right? That was part one. That was gonna give him a portion of the funds he needed to purchase the next property. And then he was able to bridge the gap on purchasing that next property by leveraging his taxable investment account. In other words, taking a loan against stocks and bonds that he had purchased in his investment account and bridging the gap there by using those funds. Then once he got into that new home, he was then able to take his time getting the old home staged, ready for the market, do all that, sell that home, pay off the home equity line of credit at that time, and then pay off the leveraged line against his taxable investment account. Is that similar or dissimilar from a bridge loan? So it, it's, I, I would say it is uh, dissimilar in the fence 
sense that he wasn't borrowing anybody's money but his own, right? In the, in the situation that we just described, he's utilizing equity and assets that are already his own. When typically in a bridge loan scenario, you are leveraging a very high percentage of the next acquisition by utilizing funds from another individual who takes a mortgage against the property, and there is typically with a bridge loan a very tight timeline to address that. There's usually a 12-month-ish balloon payment window on a bridge loan, sometimes longer, sometimes shorter, but you are now beholden to a lender that has the ability to foreclose on that new property in most instances, where in the scenario we just described, you're only beholden to yourself and the interest rate you agreed to on the HELOC and the interest rate that you agreed to on the leverage line against your investments. Seems right? like a more desirable option if, for the HELOC. Uh, I, I'd say so. I'd say so personally, because you're the master of your own destiny. But you know, then it comes back into the whole equation. How much am I paying over here? How much am I paying over here? Right? But in option A, no one can foreclose on you except for you know, you stop paying your HELOC, right? And that's your old house. <laughs> so to summarize what you said for the people who may be downsizing, aren't working anymore, but have a lot of equity or retirement accounts, they have a few options. The newest one, the HECM, H-E-C-M. -E you got right? it. HECM, there's the HELOC. Yeah. Then there is the bridge loan. Did yeah. I miss any? So n no, you're good. Uh, I, uh, there's one. So Freddie Mac, if you have a large amount of funds in your retirement assets, your IRA, your 401k, uh, Freddie Mac allows lenders, and, and you know, for those watching at home, conventional, when I say Freddie Mac, conventional loans, they allow us to use uh, basically a projected stream of income that a borrower could draw from a large amount of retirement assets. So I say that's one maybe you missed, but it comes into play in very rare circumstances. But no, the, you're, you're hitting on all the major buckets that individuals can use. The only other thing I'd add, if they are contemplating using the HECM product, 62 and older. Can only use that when you're 62 and older. That's an important one to know. Yeah, that's a Got big it. one. So for all of the people who are first time buyers or haven't bought a home or financed a home in a very long time, what are some of the best ideas for them to proceed in the best light? Yeah, uh, the biggest one I would say is, and in, in, I, I know it's scary getting your credit pulled, Everyone, you know, that's the big hesitation. It's never so, too soon to talk to a lender. It's never too soon to talk to a lender. Even if we decide, and, and I give this guidance quite frequently, that perhaps it is too soon to pull credit, it's always good to have a 30 to 45 minute consultation with a lender. If we do a credit pull and we get a true look under the hood, wonderful, that's even better. The guidance that I give every home buyer when they come to me, the most important component that I advise everyone is get the right team. Get the right team. Have the right team representing you because this is, it's a very stressful transaction. What do you okay? mean by team? Team is who's representing you. and. I, I, so, so if there's any home inspectors or title agents or, or anyone else watching, insurance, don't get me wrong, no offense. You guys are important. You are important to the transaction. You are vital to the transaction. But get the right realtor in your corner. Get the right lender in your corner. And there's lots of good lenders out there. There's lots of good realtors out there. I always tell people that you know you're going to find the right person who has let's just let's just use lender because it's easier for me to speak lender, the right products, the right rates, you know the right company, the right team backing them up. Real estate is stressful. Purchasing your first home is stressful. Purchasing any home is stressful. I always tell people something's going to go wrong. If the loan goes perfect, something funky's going to come up in inspection, right? If inspection's perfect, the property's perfect, something funky's gonna happen in the loan process, right? Those two are perfect, something's gonna pop up on, on the title search, right? And you're gonna have to deal with some goofy easement you never saw coming, like something's always gonna happen. It's very stressful. I mean, don't, don't quote me on the data source because I'll be wrong, but it's literally death of a family member, divorce, buying a home with financing. That's number three, 
most stressful things that people will deal with. And I hate to say it, your, your realtor, which God bless you guys for what you do, they become the buyer's therapist during this whole process, Sometimes. right? It, yeah. The process can also be emotional on top of stressful. Correct. But if you have a good team, like you mentioned, yeah. we mitigate that stress and emotion and make the process a lot smoother. So I say all of this because there's a lot of people that have access to the same products that I do, uh, same company that I do. Work with someone who you can enjoy what can at times be a very stressful transaction. Chris, it's been awesome having you on the show. If people would like to chat with you about loans, how can they get in touch with you? It's been wonderful being here today, Chris. Thank you so much for having me. This was great. I hope we get to do it again soon. If anyone would like to get in touch with me, so I'm, again, Chris Hardiman with the Apex Group at Guaranteed Rate. My partner Nick and I, along with 14 awesome loan officers, are here running the Central Florida market for Guaranteed Rate. You can just email me is the easiest way. So it's chris.hardiman at rate.com. That's it. Thanks for joining us. Follow us. See you next time.